Meine Damen und Herren, ich darf in Deutsch anmoderieren, dann wechseln wir die Sprache. Herr Leibrand versteht Deutsch gut, fühlt sich aber im Englischen etwas sicherer. Herr Thiele, gell? natürlich wünscht sich jeder Veranstalter ein hohes Maß an Aktualität für seine Veranstaltung. Aber ich glaube, mit Blick auf das kommende Thema hätte es ein bisschen weniger auch sein können. Ne? Also wenn ich richtig gelesen habe, 150 Länder, 75.000 Computer, 200.000 Opfer laut Europol. In Deutschland ging es noch relativ glimpflich ab. Hier gab es nur keine Anzeigentafeln mehr bei den Bahnhöfen, aber das sind wir von der Bahn ja grunde genommen ein bisschen gewöhnt. Halb lahmgelegte britische Krankenhäuser, da wird es dann schon etwas kritischer. Sie wissen, was dahinter steckt, natürlich WannaCry. Und ein solcher Angriff zeigt natürlich, auch wenn ich persönlich, ich bin kein Spezialist, aber ich glaube, das ist alles noch, ich nenne es jetzt mal Übungsphase, also so richtig ernst waren die das noch nicht, die testen gerade mal so, was alles geht. Das zeigt aber natürlich, wie verwundbar eine Gesellschaft ist, die sich immer mehr und immer weiter und immer schneller digitalisiert, ganz einfach, weil Unternehmen, weil Institutionen ganz offensichtlich nicht gut genug, nicht ausreichend vorbereitet sind auf alle möglichen Bedrohungen, denn man weiß ja nicht ganz genau, wo es herkommt. Banken und Finanzdienstleister, da ist das ein Riesenthema. Es gab einen größeren Fall, die Notenbank von Bangladesch, Sie alle wissen es. Viele, 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 Hunderte oder Tausende von kleinen Fällen, über die man gar nichts hört. Klar ist, Digitalisierung geht nur mit möglichst viel Informationssicherheit. Und Herr Leibrand, ich frage mich natürlich, können so große Systeme, wie wir sie brauchen, können relativ offene Systeme, die benutzt werden, kann da Zahlungsverkehr wirklich sicher sein? Und sind die Bösen den Guten nicht immer einen Schritt voraus? Ich freue mich jetzt auf Ihren digitalen Teufel. Bitte schön. Welcome. Thank you. Also, guten Morgen. Oder guten Nachmittag schon. Um, so, yes, thank you. Uh, as we start digitizing everything and connecting everything to everything, we have great benefits, but we also have the, uh, the digital devil of, uh, of cybercrime. Um, and uh, the latest joke I heard on that one, if you have one of these refrigerators that's connected to the internet, right, internet of things, and your refrigerator is overheating, it is probably mining Bitcoin for somebody else. So. <laughs> Uh, so, so yes, um, and, and of course the, the, the question that, that was raised in the, in the theme is uh, should the threat of cybercrime really put us off innovation and, and should we stop innovating? And clearly the answer is no, uh, for, for a variety of reasons and I'll, I'll get back to that. Uh, but one of the reasons maybe is that crime, crime is not, didn't start with uh, cyber. Eh? Crime um, is as old as money and probably older than money and it will probably outlive money given what human nature is at the end of the day. Um, and and uh, yes, uh, criminals who go after money have always used the technology that is available. Uh, in my own country, the first bank robbery occurred in 1935, and it was appropriately committed on a bicycle. <laughs> and if we fast forward to the 80s, uh, there was a guy in, uh, in the Netherlands who got very famous uh, because he managed to crack open safes that were up to a meter of concrete of steel. Um, he used a thermal lance for that, which is aluminum, and you blow oxygen over that, you get 3,000 degrees uh, Celsius, you can cut through any metal uh, with that. He was quite a charming fellow, uh, a ladies' man, and there were never any, any physical casualties, so he got away with it, had a whole reputation. Um, um, unfortunately, he could only do this wearing asbestos suits, and he died quite young of cancer, probably from the, uh, from the asbestos uh, suits. But it's another case of somebody using the available, uh, the, the available uh, technology to uh, to great advantage. So yes, now we get to, to uh, cyber crimes, and the crimes that we see today are simply the digital application of, of what used to be known as input fraud. And in the old days, you would probably forge signatures on an IOU, where there were famous uh, thefts in the banking sector with falsified faxes. Uh, you get a fax instruction to the bank, please wire this much money from the account, and it would be a falsified fax with a falsified uh, signature. Uh, you now have uh, fraud with e-banking, uh, where people, people steal through phishing the credentials of uh, e-banking, man in the browser attacks. They're all examples of, of input fraud where, yeah, as the instruction enters the system, you, uh, you find a way to, uh, to fraud with that. Um, 
And of course, it is a compelling, it's a compelling way to uh, fraud because the, the payoff is, uh, is, is large. Um, and of course, input fraud that exploits the bank's swift payments is particularly attractive for the attackers and as we've learned over the past year for the world's media. Um, and that's because on top of the amounts involved, you have the benefit of it being cross-border. And therefore, you can operate from various countries and you can transfer the money to, uh, to various countries. And that's what we saw with the Bank Bangladesh uh, fraud. Um, it, they used uh, essentially the, uh, the, the input to uh, the, the SWIFT uh, process, the, the SWIFT terminal, um, obtained the credentials, uh, sent false instructions to use their US dollar account with the Federal Reserve and transfer that money to the Philippines where it was paid out in cash by, uh, by a casino. So clearly there, there are a number of questions you can ask yourself, uh, but for me the most, uh, the most relevant question, I'm a, I'm a mathematician by, uh, by origin, and for mathematicians the first question is always, is this problem solvable? They may not always give you the solution uh, to the frustration of many, uh, but the first question they, uh, they will ask, is it solvable? In this case, I think it is a solvable problem, um, not in the sense that we can eliminate cyber fraud, but I think we can turn it into a manageable nuisance, uh, something that, that at the end of the day should not prevent us from, from reaping the benefits of, of digitization and connecting uh, systems uh, to each other. And unlike the frustrating uh, mathematicians, I will sketch out what that solution looks like and, and give you a hint for that. Um, part of the solution is the customer security program that we are or have launched now exactly a year ago. Uh, it's a comprehensive program to really help our customers secure their environment um, and end-to-end uh, -end, and to really look at the security of cross-border payments as, as we see them. Um, and it consists of three big chunks. Well, let me go through them. The, the first big chunk is helping our customers secure their own environment. Um, and a lot of that is, is basic hygiene at the end of the day. It is, um, it is things like enable two-factor authentication, uh, make sure there's no physical unauthorized access to systems, and make sure that you apply all the patches to operating systems and, and software that you have. And if anything, the WannaCry, uh, the WannaCry uh, heist that we saw, or the, the, the virus that we saw over the weekend, highlights the need to patch the systems. These the patches were available, albeit only for uh, four weeks. It also highlights the need to be on current operating systems. Uh, everybody who's still running XP these days, Windows XP, is now out of support for three years. Um, and yes, it's understandable that you do it, but it's, especially in a financial environment, it's inexcusable if you still run outdated operating systems. And frankly, it's also inexcusable if you haven't applied the latest uh, security patches. So a big part of it is basic hygiene um, and, and doing that. Now, basic hygiene, um, thank you. Um, basic hygiene is not always easy, um, basic as it is, um, so to help people really comply with that, we have introduced a number of mandatory controls that all the banks that are on the SWIFT network have to comply with. Um, there, uh, there are about 16 mandatory controls and then we have another 11 uh, advisory. Uh, and those controls are all about that their own environment. And it includes things like the latest updates and security patches, enabling multi-factor authentication, the, the, the physical accessibility of the systems, network segregation, segregation of duties. It's a combination of IT measures and procedural measures, IT awareness, IT programs in the, in the bank, uh, et cetera. So that's a, a first part of that program and we'll, we'll make compliance with those controls visible both to the overseers and to the other banks that these banks do business with, their counterparties uh, on, uh, on the network. So that's the first part of the, the program. Second part of the program really is about uh, payment flows and monitoring those, those payment flows. It's important that all the banks look at outgoing and incoming uh, payments, do reconciliation uh, at the end of the day or during the day to see if there are uh, anomalies there. Uh, check payments for, uh, for strange uh, things. We've introduced a number of tools to help with that. One of them is the daily validation report. Banks can ask uh, at the end of the day, what have we done over SWIFT? And they can immediately reconcile that with what they see. And if there are gaps there, they should probably uh, take, uh, take action. We're gonna come out uh, next year with a program, uh, a, pro a product that allows them to um, uh, set settings so uh, we will stop payments on their behalf if they meet certain parameters. If they're over a certain amount, if they're out of office hours, there are a number of things you can do, and you can ask us to stop payments that do not comply with basic uh, parameters as a, as a way to offer extra protection, especially to smaller banks in, in less sophisticated uh, environments. So we have a number of products to help with that, but at the end of the day, a big part is the bank themselves monitor these payment flows and, and exercise these controls. And then the third part, also very important, and, and, and 
been up and running for a while now is information sharing. Information sharing on a global basis. These criminals operate on a global basis. We see, we've seen now uh, other, other hacks like the, the Bangladesh Bank. We see them in multiple jurisdictions. Uh, so these people clearly operate globally, and that means that as a response, you have to really uh, uh, share information globally. So we ask that all the banks that are affected with things like the Bangladesh uh, Bank uh, fraud share that with us, and they do. Um, and we then take that information, we analyze it, and we make the results available to our community. Indications of compromise, IOCs, uh, TTPs, tools, techniques, and uh, procedures, modus operandi, et cetera, we share that. Um, and that way, people can, uh, can uh, uh, protect themselves against these attacks. And that, uh, that has seen good results uh, so far. We've, we've seen a number of attacks that are being prevented because people are more vigilant, but also because of the controls that have been put in place, alarms that we put in our software that others put in place there, etc. cetera. Um, I'm not gonna claim victory yet um, on, uh, on this one, but at least we have reasons to, uh, to believe that we're making progress and that the information sharing and the other parts of the program are, uh, are really gonna help. Now, they're not gonna be the full story uh, at the end of the day. I think there, there are a few more things that are, that are needed. Um, and those operate not so much on, on purely the SWIFT basis, but they really um, take a holistic view of the international banking system almost. Uh, we are part of a larger ecosystem of international trade, international financial flows, stock exchanges, et cetera, by, where, by which the world conducts its, uh, its finance. That is an ecosystem uh, where we play uh, a messaging, uh, uh, an information transfer role. There are other networks, and there are lots of other parties uh, involved. The security of that system is important for all countries, um, and, and therefore we think it's important to cooperate on, on two further controls, one all the way at the beginning of these of these end-to-end -end flows and the other way, um, and the other one at the end. The one at the beginning has to do with catching the bad guys. Um, uh, that's not easy for a variety of reasons. Uh, it is a task of law enforcement, but it's not easy because one, attribution is hard, and second, many of these criminals operate from countries where it's not easy to, uh, to get at them. At the same time, it is crucial that, that the international community take, takes action on this one. At the, in, at the end of the day, it's in the interest of everybody. We see banks being involved in, in all jurisdictions, um, including some of the jurisdictions that are, are typically known for harboring uh, hackers. So we think there is a platform to go after the bad guys by, by cooperation between uh, law enforcement and, and efforts are, 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 are happening there. Um, th all the way at the other end, taking money out of the system. I think that's the other, the other one that is a crucial one. Um, it, is, it is not easy to take uh, millions out of the system, but it, it can be done as has been shown by, uh, by the Bangladesh uh, fraud. Uh, we see that that's one of the points that the bad guys uh, focus on. Uh, just the other day, there was a post on, um, on the dark web, on uh, uh, sites, Onion sites that you can ask with uh, access with uh, Tor browsers. Uh, there was a post asking for mule accounts at seven specific banks uh, able to receive transfers through SWIFT 103s. So these people clearly are looking for accounts that they can uh, use to take money out of the system. These are yeah, public posts if you have the tools to access the, the darknet. Um, so in this case, we were able to get it with, with other banks to, uh, to notify these banks, etc. But it shows that, that that link of taking the money out of the system is a crucial one. And there's a real role for AML and KYC procedures, etc., to close that one uh, as well and make sure that, that yeah, we, we, we don't allow these, these accounts to exist where, where, where money is being laundered and, and uh, illicit, illicit gains are taken out of the system. So those are two additional ones, the bad guys and, and the exits of, of the system converting it into, uh, into cash. So that is, that is a, a concerted effort um, at the end of the day. It's a big effort for us as, um, as a cooperative. Um, to give you an idea, this involves 10,000 banks that are connected uh, to SWIFT. We are now conducting roadshows in each of the countries, in each of the 200 countries that we operate, where we bring together uh, the banks that are on SWIFT, uh, IT service providers, the local supervisors. We, we get everybody together in these roadshows. We discuss what these controls are, how the attestation is going to work, how compliance with them will be monitored, what you can do, etc. cetera. Um, I think we're conducting three of those in Germany, um, uh, given the large amount of, of banks involved. In total, our estimate is that uh, globally about 30,000 people will be attending these, uh, these roadshows. So this is, this is a fairly massive effort for us, together with the information sharing, 
Uh, last month, we, we launched the formal Swift Isaac portal, as we call it. Um, it's, a, it's a website. We already had it up and running uh, over the past year, but we have, now we formalized it. It's a website where our users can download in an automated way the IOCs, the tools and procedures, all of these things that, uh, that are part of the information sharing platform. Uh, so that one we got up and running. Uh, the products that I uh, sketched are out of running. So we are, we are really uh, putting a significant effort in the, into this to help maintain the security of the ecosystem and help, help our banks uh, actually maintain their own security of, uh, of cross-border payments. So a big effort. Um, at the same time, um, it, it's important to, to note that, uh, as I said in the beginning, this should not stop innovation. Innovation need to, needs to go on. We need, I think, uh, improvements in the payment system, the convenience of being able to access money anytime, anywhere, um, etc. For us, that means looking at cross-border payments, our, our, uh, our passion, uh, if you will. Um, and there, there's a big effort underway with the banks to improve the basic correspondent banking experience. We call it the, the Global Payment uh, Initiative, Global Payment Innovation uh, Initiative. It's a big effort to turn what in correspondent banking typically are payments uh, in steps. Uh, you instruct one bank, they go to their correspondent, they go to another correspondent, and ultimately they credit uh, a customer uh, somewhere. Uh, to really turn these end-to-end these -end chains into a single a single monitorable uh, one, and we're doing that through several tools. One is a payment identifier that travels with these payments through the system. The second one is a payments tracker, uh, so that you can actually see where your payment is as it moves through these uh, chains. Um, and a third one is a number of SLAs between the participating banks to process these funds as soon as they can, immediately credit the next account in the system, uh, and provide transparency on the charges that, uh, that are involved. So all in all, um, this, will, this will greatly or is already greatly enhancing the correspondent banking experience for the ultimate customers, which are often corporates that send uh, cross-border cross -border payments. Uh, a real improvement of the, of the uh, cross-border banking uh, payment uh, experience is live. Um, the Payments Tracker is live, we'll, we'll launch the next stage uh, next month with a number of big events uh, around the world, of which one here in, uh, in Frankfurt. Um, we've, we've now processed several hundred thousand payments already under this, under this new system, so we're ramping this up. Uh, practically all of the large banks that are on SWIFT are participating in this. Uh, we've got 100 participants, and I think that includes almost all of the larger clearing banks that, uh, that operate on the, on the SWIFT network. So for us, this is a big deal. This should really take payments, use technology to take correspondent banking into the 21st century and make it into a fundamentally better experience uh, for everybody. So that's a big one. Um, on top of that, we're working on a number of other things, um, um, uh, especially in the area of financial crime uh, compliance, um, allowing our banks to screen payments for sanctions, uh, do name screening, uh, test their sanctions filters. So we have a number of products. A big one is the Know Your Customer repository. Uh, where we store the KYC information of, of uh, correspondent banks on the network. That greatly simplifies the onboarding of FI counterparties uh, for banks. Some of the banks have told us that the, the cost involved in onboarding a bank on their, on their correspondent banking system is cut by 50% because all of that information is now in one place. They don't have to go to the bank to ask for charters, bank licenses, etc. So that's in a, in a single place. We now have close to 4,000 banks on that out of the total 10,000 that we have. So that's ramping up quite, uh, quite nicely and turning into, into uh, a good service. So security is not all that we're working on, but it is an important part. And at the same time, we try to make sure that we, we keep up the, the, pace, uh, the pace of innovation. So it, was, it, is, it is a big effort. Um, maybe maybe to, to put it uh, in, in a perspective and, and uh, use an analogy, and I'll use the, the German national passion cars uh, for that. I think when the automobile was invented, it brought great, great benefits to everybody, really revolutionized uh, society, but of course it also brought deadly accidents and uh, road casualties. And I think the answer to that one was not to abandon the car and go back to our bicycles and horse, and, in the case of the Dutchman, or horse and carriages, uh, but it made cars safer. We installed seat belts, uh, crash zones, airbags, anti-braking anti systems, what have you. And the impact has been spectacular. If you look at the number of road casualties per kilometer driven, um, it has gone down by orders of magnitude thanks to all of these. Um, there was no single bullet at the end of the day. It's not a single measure that saved most lives. It's really a concerted effort across the industry involving the car manufacturers, the people that design roads, the consumers, educating the consumers, what have you, legislation in terms of 
forcing people to do what's good for them and wear their uh, seat belt, perform the, the basic hygiene. Um, so a, a number of things that actually have helped make the, uh, the world a safer place uh, for automobile. Um, and if it can be done for automobiles, I'm sure it should be doable for something as mundane as, uh, as payments as well. It's a, it's a doable one. And to, uh, to close off, I'm not an Audi driver myself. I actually I have to honestly say I drive an electric car here of a, an American brand that shall be named Nasalis. Uh, but I would like to quote off with a German quote on that Vorsprung durch Technik. And I think that applies here to cyber and uh, payments as well. Thank you. Das muss ich auch mitnehmen. Slammer, thank you very much. Um, ich bleibe bei Deutsch, es ist einfacher. Ja, ist gut. Um, was mich interessieren würde, erstens, wenn man sich das anguckt, was passiert, so also sind das größte Risiko ja nicht immer die Systeme, sondern Sie haben es auch gesagt, die Unternehmen, die Institutionen, die Updates nicht installieren, die Dinge nicht aufspielen. Wie kann man das verhindern? Wünschen Sie sich hier oder kann man härtere Strafen einführen? Kann man sagen, wir schalten dich vom System ab, wenn du das Update nicht installierst? Wie kann man an dieser Stelle einwirken auf die quasi Endverbraucher, Endkunden, wo eigentlich das größte Risiko besteht? There, there are a number of ways. One, one is, at the end of the day, is these are banks, right? So we, we, we have For to example, assume banks or the biggest risk account. is on themselves, as we saw yeah. in, in, uh, in Bangladesh. So we, we should assume that they have the incentives to, to comply with these things. The other thing we're doing, and we had a long debate whether we, what is the appropriate enforcement uh, mechanism, we ended up saying that the appropriate way is to provide transparency. Uh, at the end of the day, at the other end of your connection is, is another bank that holds your account. They should also make their own risk evaluation and they can, by having transparency on the controls that the sending bank has in place, they can take measures. They can put in additional controls, uh, limit the amount of payments, uh, review the commercial terms that they had um, at the end of the day. And we thought that would be a better way of, uh, of doing this, providing them transparency and that allows for, for a certain flexibility. Uh, because frankly, I don't. I would not expect everybody to be compliant as of now. This will be a journey. Mm. We we put a pretty high bar with these controls, um, okay. uh, including some of our bigger banks. Tell us they have to do work to comply with uh, with these controls. So that that will be uh, a journey. And by providing that transparency, we think provides the best way of putting pressure on everybody to 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 get there. Good. Second question. Um, ich höre von deutschen Banken, ich weiß es nicht, ob es überall ist, aber von deutschen Banken höre ich, es gibt immer weniger Korrespondenzbanken. Das System wird kleiner. Ist das nicht auch ein zusätzliches Risiko, wenn, wenn in etwas weniger entwickelten Ländern vielleicht nur noch ein oder vielleicht nur noch zwei Banken sind, die im Rahmen eines globalen Netzwerkes zur Verfügung stehen? And I think that was one of the considerations why we didn't go for you know, shutting down banks that aren't compliant, but allowing yeah. the people that do business with them to adapt their controls. It's precisely to prevent a, a further shrinkage. Um, at the same time, we, we also have to there allow, allow the banks to play their own role on our network. They, I mean, we connect 10,000 banks. Out of those, uh, that, that's a theoretical uh, number of 100 million connections uh, on there, 10,000 times 10,000. Of those, only 1% are active at the end of the day, um, that really have a relationship uh, with each other. I have to say, we've seen, if we look at the global totals, we've seen some shrinkage of that, but not by more than, than a couple of percent over the past 10 years. So it may be that in individual enough. cases, you see, you see the risking going on, but overall, we think there's still a very capillary network, and, and part of the challenge here will be to maintain that in this world of, of cyber controls. Yeah. All right. Ich denke, die Technischen Fragen klären Sie bilateral mit ihm. Das würde jetzt hier etwas ausarten. Salavant. Thank you. Thank you.